Hi, and welcome to Workshop 10, featuring some of the top abstracts submitted in the physical therapy and respiratory therapy category this year. I'm Holly Lucen, and I'm a physical therapist at the Johns Hopkins Children's Center in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm joined today by my co-chair, Ryan Harris, an associate professor and director of the Laboratory of Integrative Vascular and Exercise Physiology at Augusta University. Ryan will be, will be working behind the scenes to manage the questions coming in for our speakers. Please make sure to submit all questions under the Q&A tab so that our speakers can address them immediately following their individual talks. The chat tab is a social feature for audience members and cannot be seen or viewed by our speakers or chairs during the session. I'm excited to hear about everything from our speakers who will be offering various insights into how to improve the quality of life for people living with CF. We're gonna start off today with Ben Crane, Benjamin Crane. He comes to us today from Israel. He is a graduate from Emory University and he's gonna be presenting his research on, um, we'll present his work on muscle health, how muscle health contributes to the greater quality of life in adults with cystic fibrosis. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me pull up my presentation. All right, yeah, thank you for the introduction again. And uh, first, there are no relationships to disclose. Um, so as people with CF live longer, health-related quality of life becomes an increasingly important outcome. Quality of life can serve as a secondary outcome in clinical trials by de describing how the illness impacts the daily function of a patient and how they react to a treatment or an intervention. The CF questionnaire revised, the quality of life tool utilized in this study is specific for CF and has been validated and widely used. Physical activity and fitness have been linked to higher quality of life and survival among people with CF. Individuals with CF are shown to have decreased exercise capacity and physical fitness. However, specific indicators of muscle health like body composition and muscle strength have been less studied in relation to physical activity. Sarcopenia, defined as the loss of muscle mass and function, increases morbidity and mortality in clinical populations. Simple clinical tools to monitor muscle health and links with quality of life in, a, in individuals with CF are needed. Hand grip strength is commonly used to measure peripheral muscle function. Higher hand grip strength is associated with improved lung function in some CF studies. Muscle quality, an index of strength per unit of lean mass is another indicator of muscle health and is novel in CF research. Our specific aims were, one, compare physical activity, muscle strength and muscle quality between the adults with CF and healthy controls. Two, assess the relationships between quality of life and body composition, physical activity, and muscle quality among adults with CF. And lastly, uh, to assess the utility of hand grip strength as a proxy for body composition in adults with CF. This study was an observational cross-sectional study design. The study had a healthy control group of 24 adults with an age match CF group of 27 individuals. Our inclusion criteria for participants with CF, they had to be 18 or older and they must have a clinically stable medical regimen of greater than three weeks. Our exclusion criteria for participants with CF, if their recent FEV1% uh, predicted was less than 40%. We use the CFQR uh, as our quality of life uh, to assess quality of life in uh, participants with CF. It has 12 domains and 50 questions. It is scored from zero to 100 with higher scores representing better quality of life. The International Physical Activity Questionnaire, a self-reported physical activity assessment, was utilized to measure physical activity. The questionnaire is measured in METs or metabolic equivalents, 
where resting would be one met. Walking is around three mets. Jogging or biking around six mets. And sprinting is 10 or more mets. This questionnaire differentiates activity level by intensity with low being three to five mets, moderate six to nine mets, and vigorous 10 or more mets. This study used DEXA dual ener energy x-ray absorbed geometry whole body scans to analyze body composition measures, the Jamar hand dynamometer for hand grip strength, and muscle quality was simply hand grip strength divided by arm lean mass, which was from DEXA. So this first uh, table describes AIM-1 results. Comparing the clinical characteristics and demographics of the healthy controls versus individuals with CF. So on the top here are the controls in the CF group. And on the side here, uh, these are the different characteristics. So as you can see over half of the female, uh, over half of the participants were female. Uh, the mean age was in the late 20s. The FEV1% predicted was relatively high for individuals with CF, and the BMI was in a normal healthy range. As you can see on the rightmost column, there are uh, no significant differences uh, of any of the characteristics. This table shows the hand grip strength, muscle quality, and varying levels of physical activity uh, of the healthy control group versus individuals with CF. So here are the characteristics and controls versus CF group. And as you can see on this uh, column as well, uh, there are no significant differences. This next table showed correlations of varying levels of physical activity versus body composition, hand grip strength, and muscle quality in adults with CF. So here are the varying levels of activity. And then here are uh, BMI, lean mass, fat mass, uh, hand grip strength, arm lean mass, and muscle quality. Um, so as you can see highlighted in blue, uh, vigorous intensity activity was negatively correlated with uh, fat mass and low intensity activity was, uh, was positively correlated with muscle quality and muscle quality was also positively correlated with total activity. Um, also, I just want to specify these are uh, Spearman correlations. So this data table shows that higher physical activity relates to better quality of life. So um, on the top row here, this is the uh, physical activity and hand grip strength and muscle quality. And then over here are the different CFQR domains. There are no significant correlations with a bunch of the domains, but the th these three had significant correlations. So physical functioning was significantly and positively correlated with vigorous intensity activity. Health perceptions was positively correlated with health perceptions and uh, or with total IPAC and vigorous intensity activity. And uh, body weight was negatively correlated with, uh, with muscle quality. So this data table shows that higher lean mass is related to better quality of life. As you can see in the blue highlighted squares, there are many significant correlations with fat mass and fat free mass. Um, lean mass and arm lean mass are positively correlated with emotion and body image, as well as total mass is uh, positively correlated with body image. So this figure shows linear regression plots of hand grip strengths in adults with CF uh, with body composition measures. Whereas BMI in this first table is not significantly uh, correlated with hand grip strength, uh, 
lean mass, percent body fat, and total bone mineral density were uh, significantly correlated. Uh, lean mass and total bone mineral density were both uh, positively and significantly correlated to hand grip strength, and percent body fat was negatively correlated with hand grip strength. And these relationships held even after adjusting for age and sex. So in conclusion, the, this study emphasizes the need to maintain lean mass and engage in physical activity for increased quality of life. Secondly, hand grip strength was positively associated with lean mass and inversely related to uh, body, body per percent fat among adults with CF, suggesting this simple and easily accessible measurement may have utility as a surrogate for lean mass assessment. Finally, larger studies are needed to confirm these preliminary results. Future research uh, should utilize objective assessments of physical activity, such as accelerometry data, and investigate additional measures of muscle strength and function longitudinally, as well as exercise interventions to increase lean mass and fitness levels in CF. So I wanna thank uh, especially my, my lab, the Alvarez and Ziegler lab pictured here, and also everyone else who helped me out at the University of Emory. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ben, that was great. Um, with the split of men and women pretty much equally in your study, do you happen to look at any outcomes in a sex dependent manner? Um, so that wasn't really my focus of the study. Uh, I did look at some of that, but I wanted to really focus more on uh, just comparing the healthy controls with the um, with the uh, with the CF group. But um, when we did break up the sex characteristics, there were a couple, but very few. Um, significant differences between uh, the the healthy controls and the uh, and and like the the CF group with um, you know male and female. And then um, I also because we are looking at hand grip strength in our clinic too, so I I find this real interesting because this is one of the things that we are looking at for is lean body mass. Did you? I saw that the numbers were very comparable between the CF group and your norms. Did you happen to, or the norm group, did you happen to look at how they can compare to actual norm values that are recorded in the literature? Um, for which values again? The hand grip strength. Oh, the hand grip strength. Yeah, yeah so I did look at that. Um, I, I was researching a lot about hand grip strength and it was uh, very comparable to a lot of other studies that I did see in terms of the hand grip strength values. And we have a question coming in. Did you look at the socioeconomic status in relationship to quality of life? Um, that, was, uh, not, that was not really a part of my study that much. Um, it wasn't my main focus of the study. Um, so I, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't collect as much data as I would have liked in terms of the, uh, in terms of socioeconomic status. So, um, it was just not, it was not a focus of my study. Um, I also noticed in the study that you, the actual, the CF population was more active than your control population. Is that, do you think, because the lung function was higher in this group, or can you speak to that finding? At least yeah, the moderate so activity? I think that this is definitely the uh, biggest weakness of our study was the fact that we used a um, self-reported physical activity questionnaire. Um, I would really have liked, um, and in the future, we'll, we'll like to... Uh, to, to use more objective measures such as accelerometry data uh, for, for physical activity um, because 
I've researched this and, and a lot, a lot in the literature suggests that um, people commonly over report when they do uh, self reported physical activity questionnaires. And I have another question coming in asking about if the if your team was able to weed out the participants per perception of vigorous activity versus moderate activity or, or intensity, how was that explained to them. Yeah, so it was uh, it was said in specific questions on the physical activity questionnaire, and um, it was it, it was split up into different activities. Um, the vigorous was commonly for activities such as sports, participating in sports, or just um, asking about high intensity interval training um, or sprinting. And then um, the rest was delineated into moderate versus, uh, and, and low activity uh, versus like just with the different sort of activities. It asked specific questions about um, how much people participated in certain activities throughout their week. Great. And then I just have one other question too. Um, did, when was the time period for this data collection? Did you look at uh, if patients or your, your participants were on highly effective modulators versus um, if they weren't? Yeah, so the data collection was from 2014 to 2018. And um, I am not sure about that. Thanks again, Ben, for sharing your data. That's, that's really interesting. I think we're gonna move on to our next speaker now. Okay. Richmond is a physiotherapist at British Columbia Children's Hospital in Canada. She will present her work on the feasibility of collecting respiratory samples at home in response to the COVID-19. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Holly. Um, as Holly said, my name is Melissa Richmond, um, and I'm a physical therapist in the CF clinic at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project that was taken on by our team um, to look at the feasibility of collecting respiratory samples at home in children in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and if you're interested in looking at my poster that corresponds to this presentation, it's poster number 560. Um, I have no conflicts to disclose. So like all of you in March 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, things drastically changed and at our clinic, we had to quickly pivot. Policies were changing quickly and rapidly and we faced a sudden shutdown to essential services. We had directions to shelter in place, to minimize interactions and social distance, which forced us to cancel almost all of our in-person clinic visits and switch to a virtual health platform. We had to get creative in how to maintain optimum care and monitoring for the children in our clinic remotely. And we wanted to have a way to monitor their health outcomes from a distance. So one of the methods we switched to was the collection of respiratory samples, either a cough swab or sputum sample at home. Um, Excuse this me, was... one second. Um, Melissa, I'm so sorry. Can you share your screen? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, that would be, I just want people to be able to see all the information you're sharing because it's, it's good. For sure. How, oops, is that better? Perfect, so sorry about that. Um, uh, so, pr uh, so again, prior to the COVID-19, uh, we collected respiratory samples um, every three months at a virtual, sorry, at an in-person clinic visit, um, and it was never done at home. If a family couldn't come to clinic, um, they would go to their local family doctor for collection. I understand that uh, the collection of these samples at home is done by different individuals in different clinics, but in our clinic, um, my role is to review the airway clearance technique um, and exercise, and typically along with that airway clearance review, I'm the team member that will collect the sample at the time from the children. So again, our project was to see if this was feasible to collect the samples at home by the parent or caregiver. 
So what we did is we asked families, um, we gave them instructions to collect a respiratory sample at home. If the child developed a new or increased cough, or if they were due for a routine surveillance um, sample in conjunction with their virtual health visit. I want to note that um, we followed all the guidelines for COVID testing with the new coughs and fevers in the children. Um, so if COVID was ruled out and they had an ongoing cough and needed a sample. So in the infants and younger children who are unable to expectorate sputum, we would collect a cough swab. And in the older children who are able to expectorate sputum, we would collect a sputum sample. Uh, we mailed sampling kits um, or couriered them to families, and that depended on how urgently um, we needed the sample, and it also depended which service was more reliable at the time. Eventually, we found that Canada Post, which is our national mail service, was sufficient, and the kits would arrive within two to four days, but occasionally we would send um, a courier for overnight at a slightly higher cost. In the kits, we provided a sample cup and a swab for sampling, a tongue depressor, the lab requisition, um, filled out completely and identifier labels for the sample. We, we put in a few extra supplies in case there was contamination of the sample at home. Um, we developed written and a video teaching material to facilitate the home collection. We developed this quickly, it was simple, it was a kind of a PowerPoint style presentation. Um, and if needed, I would complete a video or a Zoom call with the families to collect the sample in real time just so that I could watch the technique and ensure there was no contamination of the specimen. And sometimes um, a phone call was sufficient just to walk them through the steps and how to label and drop it off. The samples were dropped off at a local lab close to the family's home and then transported to BC Children's Hospital for processing in our microbiology lab. Uh, following this, the families were then sent a survey um, to rate their experience with the process. And we asked several questions about the process along the way and how satisfied they were. So the results from today are just, they capture April 7th to June 24th, 2020, but we continue to do this process and we continue to collect results. Um, during this time, 64 out of 83 respiratory samples were collected at home. Um, 43 of these were cough swabs and 21 were cute. Uh, sputum samples, and the rest were collected either because they came to see us in person in clinic or because they were seen by their local family physician. And it captured children with CF um, as young as nine months, and their oldest was 18 years. Some of our samples traveled pretty significant distances to the hospital, anywhere from two to 1,500 kilometers or 1,300 miles for processing. However, longer distances meant longer travel time, and sometimes this was over 24 hours in transport. Um, our center is located in Vancouver, BC, but we service all of British Columbia and the Yukon Territory. So it's actually quite a significant different, uh, distance. If they drove that distance, it would probably take over 24 hours. So most of the samples collected at home grew organisms that were consistent with the child's usual organisms, which we were happy about. There was normal flora, Staph aureus, Haemophilus influenza, Stenotrophomonas multifilia, and Burkholderia cepacea. Four samples during this period grew Pseudomonas ceruginosa. Three of those were a new growth or a new regrowth after a period of time, and one of them was in a child who grew it chronically. Um, a few samples actually showed no growth, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then a few of them showed just various gram-negative bacteria. So this table just shows the breakdown of the samples we collected. And this is the younger age group from basically zero to 10. And you can just see by the breakdown that in the younger children, the majority of the samples collected were a CF cough swab and it shows the organisms growing. Um, and then as we get to the older age group, you'll see that it was mostly a sputum sample, which is what we would expect. Um, it's a little bit 50-50. So because we sent the sampling supplies to a family for both, it was kind of at their discretion whether or not they could collect and actually expectorate sputum. Whereas in a clinic setting, we would done, have done a lot more encouragement to actually try to get them to expectorate the sputum. So this shows the breakdown again in a slightly different picture. You can see that the most common organism that we uh, grew was the Staph aureus. Um, and some of them showed no growth and some of them showed normal flora and various other bacteria. But I want to point out um, 
these ones here. So a few of them showed no growth, which we hypothesized could have been a sampling error. Families didn't um, go, go into the mouth uh, deep enough to get a good sample, or uh, it could have been due to the delay in transport for some of them. The ones where we saw some kind of different uh, gram-negative bacteria, we hypothesized could have been a contamination in the sampling, um, because in some, some of those samples, they were children in the toddler age group where the families actually reported more difficulty obtaining the sample. So we're not sure about those, but those are something that we pointed out in, um, when we were analyzing our results. Our follow-up survey, we had about a 50% response rate from the parents when they were asked to rate their satisfaction with the process. And families that responded reported pretty high satisfaction with the collecting the respiratory samples at home with an average score of a mean score of 91 out of 100, but the range was from 50 to 100. And they overall rated the process as very easy to complete, which we were happy about. This process wasn't without its challenges though. So one of the challenges, which I've already kind of mentioned was geography. So the time it takes for the sample from the remote areas of the province to make it to the um, BC Children's Lab for processing. Um, we learned through the process that the day of collection did matter for transport. So if the children lived in very remote areas, they couldn't drop it off on a Thursday or a Friday um, because it wouldn't be shipped out in time to arrive in our lab. Um, again, so we had to start guiding families that they had to do it in the early time of the week, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, so it arrive in time. Second is the technique. So for the younger children to obtain a cough swab, you often needed two parents or two caregivers to, to collect the sample. One needed to kind of hold the child and give them a hug to make sure their arms didn't grab onto the sampling stick. And there was an increased risk of contamination. Um, we tried to use the video monitoring to kind of control for this. So if I was observing on the video, I could point out um, uh, points of contamination. But again, scheduling video calls has its own challenges. And even having the extra person making sure that the family stays on video can also be challenging. So um, there was good and bad parts of it. However, we also want to celebrate our successes. So we had really good uptake from the families and good family participation. They were willing to give it a try. They listened to the directions and participated well. They showed good understanding with the virtual teaching and the follow-up. Um, families let us know when they needed a little extra support, where they wanted to have the virtual call. And some um, quite confidently had said, oh, we've seen this hundreds of times, we can easily do it. And some of them found it more difficult in real life than they had anticipated. Families were overall very satisfied. They were quite happy not to come into the hospital if, di if they didn't need to, but to still have a result. And overall, um, for the majority of the time, we had reliable results. We didn't have too many surprises, which is excellent. So in conclusion, in our world where virtual health is rapidly expanding, what we need is feasible and reliable outcome measures when our in-person um, CF clinic visits are replaced with virtual care. Um, we recognize that sampling of children can be challenging, particularly in the younger group, in the toddler age group. But collecting these samples at home, from our experience, is a feasible way to monitor health outcomes in this population. So moving forward, so the results I presented went only till about June, but we've continued to do this into the fall. And so we've had over 100 and counting. Our, our weekly sampling rate is decreasing a little bit because we're seeing slightly more children in person than before. Um, but families who are being seen virtually are very reliable and dropping off a sample um, around the time of their clinic visit so we can get the re results. We're getting consistent results and family satisfaction with the process and their participation remains high. They actually require less support from our team as they get more practice. So the video calls to collect the samples are getting less and less after we've gone through the cycle of almost our whole clinic at least once in the last few months and the techniques improving. So we're getting less of those potential contaminants and less of the no growth. So we're excited to see where this leads, especially as I know our world of virtual health is going to continue and continue to grow and there's gonna be a lot more opportunities in the future. So I just wanna thank everyone for listening, whether you're listening live or listening um, on the recording. And so I'm happy to answer any questions and interested in hearing what other clinics are doing as well. 
Great, <clears throat> great work, Melissa. Um, I would find it very impressive that you're able to jump in so quickly with educational videos and sending out the kits. I'm kind of curious about your non-responder rate. Did people just, did you send out more kits to try to get them or, or did they give you answers or did you follow up with the people that didn't respond? To the survey? Yeah. Um, yeah so, I mean, it was, it was a, it was a chasing issue a lot of the time. So because we had made the survey anonymous, because we really wanted authentic feedback from families, uh, we couldn't actually tell which people had responded and which people hadn't to the survey. So I anticipated that either the very unhappy people or a few very, very happy people would respond and we were gonna miss a lot of the middle group who were kind of amb ambivalous to the whole um, opportunity. Um, but in talking just one-on-one -on -one with families and getting their feedback, people were just very thankful that we we're following up and um, expressed like that they were just glad that they could have results because for families, it's a, again, another uh, clinical outcome measure that they would have missed out on if we hadn't collected remotely. Yeah, I feel like it's usually cultures and the PFTs that people want, and that's why they want the in-person visits. So I'm just curious if you had any plan to use this in conjunction with home spirometry? Yeah, we do. So that's just a challenge um, with kids. And um, we're just in the process of uh, testing different devices. Um, we have different restrictions in Canada of what devices are available compared to the, the U.S. So um, we're just, um, we have a few samples. We don't have home spirometry opportunities yet. And we're looking forward to being able to add that in as well, because I agree, those are the two outcome measures that are super important and that we could have a, a more clear and full picture. I think it's going to be easier for us to implement those with the older children, um, obviously than the young, younger ones. And then we have a question coming in. Do you have any tips to increase the reliability of the sample in those younger children when it comes to collection techniques? This comes from a peds nurse, but I know that that's a challenge for, for our clinicians as well as obviously the parents. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I found at the beginning, um, the easiest was to actually observe it because I was very low trust at first. So having the camera on to make sure that like there was no touching, I started every conversation with, please wash your hands. Do not touch the surfaces. Do not touch any part of the sampling stick with your, your hands or the environment. And so I think if nothing else, families knew that that was the most important thing was to avoid contamination. And then I learned best ways to hold the kids were with a hug where they're against you so that if they do flail backwards, that then they're supported and you can get it. Um, families, that I think was the most challenging part is some of them don't want to be the clinician. They want to be the family but they understood the importance of collecting the samples. So that's where we got a uh, good buy-in. And sometimes the two caregiver technique was the most effective. All right, great. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much. And our last speaker is Lauren Mitchell, who's a physical therapist at Johns Hopkins Hospital working with the adult CF clinic. Hi, thanks, Holly. So today I'll be talking about addressing vestibular toxicity through physical therapy screening and an algorithm in clinic. I don't have any relationships to disclose. So Holly on Wednesday took us through a very thorough explanation of the vestibular system and vestibular toxicity. But briefly, the vestibular system is the leading contributor for sensory input for helping us maintain our balance when we're moving our head and our body. When it has dysfunction, people can have dizziness, blurred vision, or difficulty with their balance, as well as several other symptoms. Vestibular toxicity can often result when medications damage the hair cells in the inner ear. And we're gonna specifically be looking at aminoglycosides with our patients. So specifically with CF, the top three aminoglycosides that we need to keep an eye out for are tobramycin, gentamicin, and amikacin. What's even more concerning for our patients is that tobramycin is not normally just given once and then they move on with their life. They generally are exposed several times over the course of their life to IV tobramycin. Amikacin, we know our patients are normally getting high doses for a long period of time. So we really need to be aware of the cumulative da um, damage that's possible for our patients. 
One research study found that as many as 79% of people with CF who were exposed to IV tobramycin demonstrated vestibular hypofunction during the administration. Interestingly, that same study only found that 23% of the patients were having hearing loss. So clearly that's telling us that screening for tinnitus and hearing concerns is not sufficient to capture vestibular toxicity. Additionally, another study found that 30% of patients that previously had had IV tobramycin exposure continued to have hypofunction even after the administration was over. So the PTs in our clinic decided we needed to change and look a little bit differently at how we were screening for vestibular toxicity rather than just asking, do you have any concerns with your balance? We needed a four prong approach. We needed something that was gonna help us identify patients that were at risk for vestibular toxicity. We needed a way to screen for impairments, determine what would be the best and most appropriate interventions, and then also a way to help guide our interdisciplinary conversations with the rest of the team based on the results that we were finding. So our first step for patient identification, like most of you, we do preclinic chart reviews and we do preclinic meetings. During our chart reviews <clears throat> for this project, we identified anybody who had had IV aminoglycosides in the past two years. And if so, then we initiated our clinic-based clinic screening and testing program on them. Throughout the rest of the study, if anyone had previously tested positive for vestibular dysfunction, then when we were doing our chart reviews, we checked to see if we'd referred them to an ENT, had, we, had they gone and had we gotten any results, and then also see where they do for any follow-up testing. Then once someone was identified as having had IV aminoglycosides in the past two years, then we started the symptom question. We wanted to highlight the three major symptoms, vertigo, oscillopsia, and balance. So you can see on here that each symptom has two questions. The first is more of a typical presentation of the symptoms, whereas the follow-up question is more specific to hypofunction in case the general symptom questions weren't as easy to identify for the patient. So for example, if you look at the balance one, it says, have you experienced feeling off balance or unsteady? If the patient answers no, we dig a little bit deeper and more specifically with, how about when walking when it's dark or on a soft or uneven surface like gravel or grass? just to help tease out that hypofunction symptoms a little bit deeper. Then we, then we went into the testing protocol. Every patient underwent three different tests for vestibular function, oscillopsia, and balance. For vestibular function, we did the head impulse test. And what we did to determine whether or not someone was positive was that we tested each ear three times. And if somebody had corrective saccades in two out of three trials on any given ear, then they were deemed positive. And then we determined whether it was bilaterally positive or only on a single side. For oscillopsia, we used the dynamic visual acuity test. So we chose to use the ETDRS chart. And what we do is we'd have them sit down and we'd ask them to read down to the lowest line where they could still identify all the characters. Then we would forward flex their head and oscillate their head at two hertz and ask them to give them the same instructions again. If somebody lost more than two lines in being able to identify all the characters, then they were considered positive. And then finally for balance, we initially were trying to decide between the functional gait assessment and the dynamic gait index, knowing that the APTA's hypofunction um, clinical practice guidelines recommended both. So first we wanted the DGI because we're like, oh, well, it's only eight items. So that'll be better for a busy clinic. But when we started digging into it a little bit more, we realized that the FGA had items that we thought would be better for our patient population. So it included walking backwards, walking with your eyes closed and walking with a narrow base of support, with the D, which the DGI didn't. So maybe it could be a little bit better at picking up on subtle vestibular hypofunction in our young patients that are probably compensating pretty well. The next challenge was we then had to decide how are we gonna determine somebody is positive or negative with the FGA since there's no um, guideline for this in this patient population. So we decided to use that if someone was below the 95% confidence interval for their age and a healthy norm, we'd consider them positive. 
then this is the chart demonstrating our algorithm to help determine interventions based on testing. So I think it's important to notice that any positive test leads to alerting the MD and initiating that conversation with the team. But then specifically, if somebody had a positive head impulse test, that was telling us that they were having vestibular dysfunction. So we wanted an ENT referral to hopefully get more objective data. If somebody had a positive dynamic visual acuity test, then that was telling us they were having oscillopsia. So we'd get the ENT referral, but also VOR exercises would be appropriate for them to help manage those symptoms. And then finally, if someone had a positive FGA, then vestibular rehab would be appropriate to deal with the balance deficits. Um, Someone having could obviously have more than one positive. So if they had a positive hit, it didn't mean they did not get the VOR exercises or vestibular rehab. We just really wanted to target our impairments to the in, in, interventions really intentionally because we know the burden of care is already really high with our patient population and adherence is pretty low. So we really wanted to be intentional on picking what we were using to intervene. Then for our results, over the course of five months, which like most of us was cut a little bit short due to COVID, we had 55 patients screen positive for IV aminoglycosides in the past two years and also um, complete our full battery of all testing. 53% of the patients reported some sort of symptom with the most common being dizziness and vertigo, then balance impairments, and then lastly, oscillopsia. 13% of our patients had positive head impulse tests, 20% had positive DVA tests, and for the functional gait assessment, the average score was 28.8 out of 30, but 33% of our patients scored below the 95% confidence interval for their age group and the healthy norms. And then additionally, we wanted to look at how symptoms and testing were correlating. So if you look at that chart over there on the side, that tells us the percent of positive tests that also were reporting some symptoms. So anywhere from 64 to 71% of patients that tested positive somewhere for in the vestibular testing also were reported some symptom to us. In conclusion, we felt that the physical therapists were really well positioned to help identify and intervene with vestibular toxicity screening in clinic. In our clinic, we found it feasible to do because we had access to a hallway and stairs, which are needed for the FGA or the DGI. Um, something else I think that's worth noting is if you're doing the dynamic visual acuity testing, you need at least four meter distance between, your, between the patient and where the eye chart sits. Um, then additionally, it did add time to clinic. So it added give or take about 20 minutes to our clinic sessions. This is a lot and we knew that, but we also felt that the information and the outcome that we were getting from this was valuable enough to warrant that much amount of time. And then especially now knowing that our patients are living longer, we wanted, it's possible that our patients right now, they're young and they're healthy, they're probably compensating pretty well, but as they age, they're gonna have changes to their other senses and that vestibular hypofunction is probably gonna become more relevant, more uh, obvious. So we really felt that early detection of this is gonna be important. It can help us facilitate interdisciplinary conversation with the rest of the team. And it can also allow us to have more patient-centered decision-making. So before I go, I just want to thank the other physical therapists on my team, as well as Dr. Dezubi, who really, um, everyone here was the manpower in doing the research to help us put this together um, and carry it out. And then the rest of the um, Johns Hopkins adult CF team. Here are my references and I'm available for any questions. Excellent, thanks, Lauren. Of course, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart too. So it's always to see what's happening on our adult side. Um, I'm curious um, why you decided on the two years for looking back for screening. And now that you've got a few under your belt, um, would you might possibly dig back further to see what other people's aminoglycoside exposure or other risk factors might be? Great question. So dealing with, so we thought about that a lot, but Dealing with adults, we don't have complete history of all of our patients and we didn't have really very easy access to it. 
Additionally, we were also already screening for vestibular impairments, but not in this manner. So we were looking for something to roll out this new, this new vestibular screening program um, without undertaking it for everybody. And really one of the big things that we wanted to find out was, could this be our new workflow and will this work in clinic? So we didn't need to do it on everybody yet. If we thought that it was gonna be possible, then yes, then we'll start doing it. Um, and COVID aside, once we get our hands back on our patients, I, we'll move forward with doing it with anybody. Um, but I, and I think I mentioned, we also don't have complete history of all of our patients. Patients come from other clinics, they come from pediatrics, um, but we have easy access to the last two to three years. Okay, great. We have several questions coming in from the audience. Is there any relationship between, someone said they might've missed this, but is there any relationship between CF lung disease and vestibular dysfunction that you've seen? We didn't look at that, but um, we know from other presentations, at least with pediatrics, that um, maybe in hospital admissions and things like that could likely, um, you, would, you could assume that increased exposure to IV immunoglycosides might correlate, but not necessarily. The research doesn't actually support that. Like why some people have ototoxicity, why some people have kidney toxicity, some have it and some don't. Okay, I'm curious how you're gonna answer this one. Do you think any of this assessment could be done at home? Um, or as be, especially since we've been going more and more virtually. Okay, so the head impulse test, I would say no because it, you're relying on them not being aware. It's a reflex to test the VOR. So if they know that their head is gonna move, you're not gonna get a reflex. Um, the DVA, maybe, you would have to have another person <laughs> confidently oscillating their head at two hertz. Um, so probably unlikely. Um, and then the FGA, yes, we know a lot of people are doing balance testing at home. Although, to be honest, that's probably our least valuable because so many of our patients score so high because they're young and compensating. Um, um, going on the FGA too, do you think some of the lower results were all related to vestibular or could there have been other causes like musculoskeletal or maybe even some neuro issues? So I almost put another poster together um, where I analyzed the information of our, of our FGA results because it was also some of our older patients that were scoring lower as well. And then it was either just not objectively, our older patients or some of our patients that had known and like noticeable vestibular impairments. Um, we did catch a couple people that surprised us, but most people either scored really high or got knocked down on, you know, those three to four more difficult ones. Um, there's also some questions about if you know of any other medications that you found that may cause problems with vestibular toxicity. Um, there are plenty. You can actually yeah. pretty easily Google it. I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. Some of the um, other ones that we pay attention to are azithromycin. Lasix is another big one for anyone that's an acute care physical therapist. Um, I, I actually, outside of CF, this has really resonated with me with my just acute care patients in general to pay attention to. And have you seen, to follow up with that, have you seen any issues with inhaled aminoglycosides after extensive exposure? Um, I think that could play a role. Right. So using the term extensive, I don't know, but most of the research supports that since the, the um, inhalation isn't systemic, there's not good correlation. There's not as big of a concern for it. Um, if somebody already has vestibular impairment is showing that it's a major concern, I think that that would be a perfect conversation to have with the medical team, but inhaled by itself doesn't show a, much of a concern. No. I feel like there's a couple other questions. Sorry, I have to scroll down the list just jumped on me. Um, oh, I think we might be out of time. So sorry. <laughs> and, and all of you who are leaving questions and things in the chat um, that we can't see right now, but we can have the speakers look over those questions and respond to them too. So if you have a question, they can respond in chat for everyone to see after the presentation. 
But I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's been a great session. I think we've had a lot of variety in our speakers, and hopefully you learned something new today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.